Hello and welcome to part 11 of The Physics of Consciousness by Ivan Antic, an audiobook production brought to you by Transcending Ascension, but all copyrights to the author. Animals perfect perception through movement and simpler actions. There are many transitional forms in this symbiosis of cells, plants, insects, and animals. The divine consciousness perfected simple shaping and first movements throughout the living world from the small tentacles and tails that unicellular organisms use for movement, followed by various creepers that carefully feel for a spot to attach to the quick trap of a carnivorous plant. The next higher experience of consciousness in all the possibilities of existence is the world of animals. The divine consciousness for the requirements of this realm develops muscles for all possible movements. It develops forms that can crawl and jump, run, dive, and fly. Sometimes they get teleported from one place to another, the way some insects and ant queens do. The skill for movement in animals achieves a level of incredible perfection. The nature of motion in animals is based completely on the struggle for survival and reproduction. And in a struggle like that, consciousness experiences all possibilities of physical movement. Above all, it is a struggle because consciousness must be coerced into creating complex shapes from elementary ones. From inert mineral forming and inert plant motion, only circumstances of action and external coercion may develop forms that are capable of moving in all ways possible. They could never do that on their own. Elements are formed by outer influences, while plants are also formed and adjust to the outside environment. And the movement of animals must be set in motion by in external influences and coercion as well. The initial motivation is the search for food. The result of all movement in animals is multiplying and producing offspring. With this, the purpose of animal life has been accomplished. There is barely any space in between for playing and creativity in searching for food. The divine consciousness keeps developing perception even beyond this point. Action and coercion in the form of a struggle for survival are also required in order to attain this perfection. The food chain in the animal world is the impelling force that develops perception and together with it the manifestation of consciousness. Sensory perception and skills of movement can be perfected in a fight of that kind only in avoiding danger and finding ways of outwitting prey. The perfect movement skills and perception, there is a constant exchange of life energy amongst animals. All animals are in the business of devouring one another. They are all food for each other. The useful and the practical have merged to achieve the best possible result, perfecting perception and movement with food and survival. The divine consciousness in animals is experienced not only in the form of simple physical movement, it also entails will. This is the turning point where awareness of one's own will appears as though it were in motion. An animal is the type of consciousness that for the first time can of its own accord decide when and how to move. In minerals and plants, movement was always instigated by outer influences. The awareness of one's own will while moving grows into more complex structures, into entering relationships with other animals, into individual and group relationships. Models of social organizations from colonies of social insects to herds and the hierarchy within them, to the very complex family communities and communications that develop amongst them. Ravens, for example, live in family-oriented communities. They have a language of over 800 voices they communicate with. Fledglings stay on for eight years with their parents before learning everything they need to know. Everyone looks after every single member of the community, and they are also capable of handling simple tools in their quest for food. There is a telepathic communication in certain species, in particular the feline, but in many other species as well.
Animals that live with people are even more able to manifest consciousness, to communicate with people, to reorganize their moods and thoughts, to save the lives of people when they are in danger, even to sacrifice their own lives in order to save humans. Those are the moments when higher consciousness acts through the limited bodies of animals, which is a proof for the existence of higher consciousness because the bodies of animals were not originally designed to have it. However, apart from the most complex types of movements and actions, both individuals and group ones, the divine consciousness in animal forms of existence is not particularly turned towards itself in terms of phenomena, but only outward towards the objects and toward exercising all possible forms of phenomena. That is why each animal must be what it is by nature. It is unable to change itself. Only the human is capable of this. Humans perfect perception through the drama of their lives. In order for the motion and functioning of consciousness in this three-dimensional physical world to be perfected, a body in which this functioning will be perfected must have all the required sensory and action organs. Only a human body has all the sensory and action organs. All animals are lacking in either sensory or action organs as compared to the human. That is a clear distinction between the human and the animal body. All the myths of creation suggest that God made the human at the very end of creation as its most perfect creature. Nature, too, has completed its task with the human by making a non-organic and organic world, by perfecting all plant and animal shapes in all possible motion and functioning, by creating the human body that has all the perception abilities necessary for survival. Nature has become only equipped for self-preservation. Its development has been finalized with the appearance of the human, all the necessary conditions for the human to actualize the divine consciousness in existence have been created. The completion of perfecting human perception did not happen all at once. It is still happening as we speak. The same way there is not a clear line between mineral, plant and animal worlds. There is not yet a clear line between the animal and human ones yet. There was too much animal content in the original people. Perfecting perception in human form was later continued in fighting for power, which is yet another form of the struggle taking place in the animal food chain. The cruel fight for survival and power between leaders of the pack and gangs in large cities, like the Mafia, all the way to the political function of presidents of whatever is merely a continuation of the animal development of perception into the more complex and higher human form of consciousness. Likewise, working conditions, the distribution of goods, and social conditions with elements of exploitation are all very illustrative of this. They are all somewhat more subtle forms of functioning in the food chain, which is evolving from animal to human form, and which exerts pressure and coercion on the people, forcing them to actualize their consciousness. In fact, in the human, the food chain got its far more complex and versatile form. The lives of people as compared to those of animals seems like evolution and a, a gigantic step forward, but the more appropriate term for it would be Al Capone evolution. The way animals develop perception, though all the challenges a food chain presents to them, namely as predator and prey and basic human forms, develop consciousness of the sense of existence through all the temptations and opposites of the lower nature in them. Animal instincts in the body and higher consciousness of the soul clash in the human. The human is a bridge between earth and heaven, the lower nature and the divine sphere. All development of humankind is in overcoming bodily aspects and actualizing higher consciousness of the soul. This transition is manifested in finding the meaning of existence in an everyday quest for knowledge and understanding in the individual experiences of the human in all interpersonal relationships, and in all great works of art, culture, and creativity that make this civilization what it essentially is. 
The issue here is not Darwin's theory of evolution, not the way it has been presented to us. It is not about the evolution of life, but about the process of manifesting consciousness, its creative participation in existence and life, and raising the level of awareness of the true purpose of existence and life. This is the real issue behind the story of evolution. We have ascertained that all realities are multidimensional and parallel, that creation is instant and complete, virtually rendering evolution impossible. Still, the nature of the three-dimensional physical plane is such that everything manifests in linear time. It helps us see the whole process. All the details and aspects of manifesting the divine consciousness with minerals, plants, animals, and people simultaneously occupying the same space. And based on our time frame, we conclude that it has all evolved over a period of time. When we perceive momentary and timeless multidimensional existence from linear time, we then believe we see evolution. When we finally see the whole process and make sense of it all, that does not mean that in the outer world some process of evolution does not take place objectively. The function of our consciousness in the body is to view the manifesting divine consciousness in all its aspects and details, to become aware of them and to find the meaning of it which practically means that we make it aware and as such retrieve it to its divine outcome. To retrieve consciousness to its divine outcome in this context means to recognize the whole of existence as divine, to recognize the unity of consciousness and existence, and to experience this unity as divine, to be able to view all the details of the manifestation of the divine consciousness we need a time perspective. Therefore, behind what we see as evolution lies a momentary creation from higher dimensions. We do not see the full spectrum of the causality of creation, only the physical plane. Hence, the creation seems evolutionary. The lack of evolution and momentariness of creation are shown and proven to us by anatomy, dietary requirements, and the reproduction of many types of animals and plants. The maple tree seed flies in the wind because it has wings of a, of a perfect aerodynamical shape that are able to swing like a helicopter propeller. If the wings were a fraction of a millimeter curved to a different side, the seed could not fly and the tree would not reproduce. The tree has not gradually developed these characteristics by means of evolution, because then it would have been unable to survive. Even if it had, it would have had to be aware of it, something evolutionists refuse to admit. The complete tree and design and its reproductive cycle stems from an intelligent intention and was created all at once, not over time. The same thing works for many animal species. Their nutritional habits and multiplying are such that they could not have developed gradually because two generations would not be able to make it to the real world. Therefore, we speak of the evolution of consciousness through non-organic and organic forms and humans. We do not mean Darwinian evolution, but the development and enrichment of perception and ability for functioning, the enrichment of contents and sense, the way we see these from our perspective from our three-dimensional physical bodies and minds. By no means do we assume that the, the divine consciousness needs evolution of any kind. The outer development of the divine consciousness through all possible physical shaping is finalized with the human body. Now the return of the divine consciousness towards itself has begun. The perfecting of consciousness within its possibilities, searching for the meaning of existence. Existence was being perfected up until this point. Now the meaning of existence is perfected in turn. The emphasis on consciousness and awakening becomes the all-important issue that is the only true destiny of the human. The only further growth is one that is invisible from the outside, one that takes place within the human. However, following a game of opposites and paradoxes, this innermost spiritual growth is about to transform nature most visibly. A transition from the outer to the inner represents the crystallization of I am, 
or the awareness of oneself and the higher mind, or the objective awareness of existence in general, pure wakefulness. They together with the physical mind and an understanding of the three-dimensional physical world make up the human consciousness. Everything else constitutes the objective world. Awareness of oneself is crystallized by the understanding the meaning of every shape. The mind or reason connects the higher consciousness with physical existence. The role of the human may be understood in the following way. When the divine consciousness, through individual souls, evolves through animal forms, it has awareness of objects only but not of itself. That is why animals cannot change themselves. They do not have ego, nor correct their behavior. They do not have the freedom of choice, and they always follow what circumstances and urges drive them to do. When it evolves through human forms, the divine consciousness as a soul has double consciousness of the objects and itself, and all human evolution can be reduced to the transformation and perfection of the subject through the differentiation of objects. This is the task of reason or the mind. The human form is a crossover phase from the animal to the divine, i.e. spiritual. This is the reason there are immature people who are attached greatly to the objects and contents of their life events, as well as mature ones who show higher independence, psychological objectivity, and individuality, or more accurately, higher consciousness of the soul. The Divine Presence Within when a soul finalizes its evolution through the human form, it completely transcends the world of objects and accomplishes a triple consciousness of the objects, of the subject that is aware of the objects, and of the transcendental divine consciousness that enables both the subject and the objective world. It happens by means of actualizing one eye or the whole personality. Its final awakening brings brings the insight that there is nothing else but the divine consciousness as such. That soul is in its essence divine and in complete submission to the divine as the only reality. By finalizing the organic world, perfecting perception in plants and movement, in animals, and by creating the human body with all the possibilities of perception and action in the three-dimensional physical world. The divine consciousness has finished manifesting and forming all the subtle and gross forms. There is nothing more to be created. The human is indeed the last phenomenon. The divine consciousness can create, for the divine consciousness to take that point for returning to itself, thus closing the circle of its completedness. All it takes is virtually one more twist. It has by this point manifested everything that is already existent within itself. Nothing new originated with creation of the whole cosmos. Everything else merely manifested from its potential state. Implicit order and crossed over to the actualized, the manifested state. To completely realize divine creativity, one tiny detail is needed, something that did not even exist as a potential state in this quantum soup of ether or akasha. That is something that is not in unity with the divine consciousness, something that does not exist in its individual field of all possibilities, something that will not be a simple manifestation from the potential to the actualized state. Naturally, since nothing at all is possible outside the divine absolute itself, it is virtually within it already. But unlike all other manifestations, the whole manifested cosmos, it is something the whole original divine consciousness is capable of creating, something unique. The most original thing divine consciousness can enable is an individual consciousness that is unaware of its unity with the divine consciousness and to let it live like that to act on its own free will. This individual is the modern human. In creating a human like that, a parallel can be drawn with the creation of na nature in itself. 
It has a starting point from the divine consciousness as the creative principle that shaped increasingly com complex constructs and was completed in its opposite, in creating inert matter that must be formed externally. The manifested material cosmos with its inertia is the opposite of the divine consciousness that creates all the forms itself. Matter must be formed while the divine consciousness is the one who forms it. In that way, the material cosmos and the human in it are the ultimate goal of creativity of the divine consciousness, the virtual opposite. In some myths, this individualized and self-sufficient consciousness alienated from the divine unity is depicted as the first and most beautiful angel of God, Lucifer. The story goes that he has fallen to earth, or in other words, become identified with the material processes. It is the human mind, the reason the egoic consciousness identified with the human body. Humans are identified with their minds and bodies, and by thinking they are separated from the divine whole that enables everything, which is all that is, but which is themselves as well. Though they keep thinking they are the individual who does everything as a result of their own decisions and their will. That is why they see themselves this way, as separate individuals experiencing the world as something imposed on them from the outside, something threatening. Because the more firm consciousness is, in its subjectivity, the more firm its contents are in their objectivity, and one provokes the other. Such a human believes that they were born one day and they will die some other day. Since they are always identified with the existing state, they are afraid that one day they will disappear and they refuse to think about it. But in spite of this, they still think there is something out there for them to fight for, against, in order to linger as long as possible in their ignorance. Because sadly there are too many similar individuals about and they are forced to fight one another for their lives in an illusion. Not realizing that the divine existence keeps them all together with the utmost care. The very virtual hell they inflict upon each other is not sufficient for them to realize that they lack awareness of overall existence, that their perspective is largely wrong. Therefore, the ignorant human fool is the biggest creative achievement of the divine consciousness. However, it is not only comical, since in this comic fool several things happen. First, in this act of complete separateness and independence, the divine consciousness achieves the peak of its free will. It is expressed in the story where God gave free will to the human to do as they pleased, to learn to distinguish between good and evils, themselves to eat the fruit of both trees, the tree of knowledge and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and as the final result to know God of their own free will. That will take them back to the heavenly state of the divine consciousness they were originally cast out from. Everything else in nature is conditioned. Only the human mind has independence and freedom. Or at least it has when it is on its best behavior. This independence and freedom of the human mind is an act of practicing to make perfect in order to acquire characteristics of the divine absolute itself. Second, the entire manifested cosmos was simply a preparatory stage and introduction into the creation of this human idiot. Or better to say, a divine child who plays with all the potentials that are about. The cosmos exists to create a conscious subject, no matter how capable it is of being crazy or deceived. The human mind is also capable of becoming aware of the objective world. It can be said that its ability for madness and cognition are reciprocal and stand opposed in equal measure. They are both necessary for the mind because its foundation is the principle of the freedom and the desire to try it all. Third, the return of the divine consciousness to its wholeness and completeness is possible only through the process of individuation, in a unique way, always personally and without words. Self-knowledge is always unique because of the very nature of existence which is based on consciousness, which is unsubstantial, momentary, and timeless. 
Consciousness is always unique and individual because as a divine presence, it comes into view between every two moments of existence. It is always independent of every moment of existence. It does not resemble either of them. It reveals itself between them. The individual consciousness of itself happens when we change focus from the outside through space and time and delve into ourselves in that gap between moments in time when the divine consciousness springs up. Since the nature of reality is not substantial but momentary, consciousness of reality is always individual and timeless. There is no individualization in the cosmos than the state the human mind is in. The essence of the human individualization is the same essence all the laws of physics rests on, momentariness and insubstantiality of the quantum field. Fourth, the essence of the consciousness itself is creativity. It is an expression of uniqueness, and there is no greater creativity of consciousness than to forget itself, its source and essence, and to think it is something else and not what it is in reality. The ability to be something else and not what it is enables consciousness to be aware of the true nature of everything else, of all the objects. In other words, consciousness cannot be aware of objects without the subjective state, without so much as the illusory awareness of subjectivity. The subjective state of consciousness happens as the most perfect experience in the human mind, and that is why the human mind is the most able to be aware of objects. We have already explained that the firmer consciousness in its individualization and subjectivity, the firmer its contents are in their objectivity. One induces the other. It is hard to emphasize the importance of this, but we will try. The entire physical universe originated automatically as a reflection of the subjectivity of consciousness. To the degree individuality and subjectivity is strong, to the same degree the individuality and objectivity of its contents as objects is strong. Like all the phenomena that constitute the objective world and the cosmos we live in, the stone is as hard as our eye is hard, not to say as hard as our skull. When our eye relaxes a little and dissolves and we manage to fall asleep, we find ourselves in the astral, and then we can take a stone and feel how hard it is. But in a lucid dream, it may become as soft as we want it to be. In dimensions higher than that, above the astral, in the element of air, the stone is a direct and instant reflection of our thought of the stone. Subject and object merge even closer together in the higher dimensions, until they become one in the ether. Hence, higher consciousness is a result of the higher dimensions. While the lower ones manifest a higher level of unconsciousness, the gap between subject and object grows bigger, together with the increasing hardness of objects and materiality. This simply shows that human unconsciousness automatically projects the material cosmos. The harder unconsciousness is, the harder its illusion. The ultimate reach of the hardness of the illusion of unconsciousness is the material world. This projection happens only to actualize the divine consciousness in all its possibilities, including this one where it is unaware of itself to the point it seems separated from itself in the human mind, in objects that also seem separate and independent, in the material cosmos. The material cosmos shows objectively the world of ideas. It materializes them and by so doing assists in the task of actualizing the divine consciousness. More accurately, it provides the understanding that the divine consciousness is existence itself. Therefore, the human fool Subsection 26, on the true meaning of the fool, which is the issue here, see tarot cards. The meaning of the zero-numbered card is, to be precise, it is a creative principle that carries unconditionality within, a consciousness that binds both the emergent and the non-emergent, which from the chaos spontaneously creates a form. 
was created together with the creation of this material cosmos according to the same principles of experiencing the opposites of a divine consciousness. The same way the divine existence in material cosmos has achieved the ultimate opposition point of its original unsubstantial reality. The divine consciousness in the human mind and ego reached its ultimate opposition point in the illusion of separation. Manifesting divine existence and consciousness must go hand in hand because in their foundation they are one. And the fifth one, the final one, the very focus of the mind, is its unique ability to see everything the other way around. The whole universe in every way possible, but the right way, the one that enables consciousness of the soul to incarnate and function in the physical three-dimensional world. A soul is an individual emanation of the divine absolute, and by definition it is unable not to see the divine in everything, and everything as divine. To accomplish its task, it needs tools that will help it experience the peak of creativity, of the divine consciousness, a state where it is separate from the divine absolute, enclosed with the mind of the human. This tool is the mind or reason, manas, through the mind the divine consciousness of the soul can reside and function in this world. By the act of twisting reality, the mind redirects the divine consciousness of the soul to be able to operate in the physical world and with this to transform it. Without such a function of the mind, the divine consciousness would not be able to fully present in this world. It is a divine paradox. Without a sinful human, the divine consciousness would not be present on the earth. Subsection 27 we will tread lightly here with full respect for the religious statements of many, and we will refrain from the deliberation as to why God sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, to show people how sinful they are and how to find absolution for all their sins. We will not go out of our way to prove here that the Catholic Church, allegedly the Church of Jesus Christ, the same one that fuels all the sinfulness in people by constantly insisting on it, accuses us of being guilty for living, making us all sinners, even though this might not have turned out to be the final scenario were we not initially coached that way. With a normal mind, consciousness of the soul would have nothing to do here. Once the mind becomes normal, enlightened, overcome, or transcended consciousness of the soul is released from the body and all the illusions of this world too. However, in the awakening of this sinful fool, the creation of the world happens all over again. The divine becomes again what it is in the absolute sense. Everything is a hologram. Everything that happens in the infinite cosmos happens in the infinitesimal human as well. Completely the same, only in different proportions naturally. This explains why consciousness of the soul aspires toward incarnations. Although they have a limited effect on it, the same way it explains the primordial aspiration of the human to overcome the restrictions of the body and mind, and to know the divine consciousness of the soul. This opposition is the basic characteristics of man, and is the foundation of all the creativity displayed by the human. Let us not forget, since there is no time in reality, all of this, this entire process, happens each moment. It is the way in which everything exists every moment of every day. It should not be turned into any theory, either theological or psychological. It is what constitutes us every single moment. The state of seeming separation of the mind away from the divine whole is a state of supreme creativity of the divine consciousness. For the very reason that only from that point of total objectivity may an insight into the divine whole become clear. The divine whole cannot see and get to know itself objectively unless it reaches a state of at least ostensible separation from itself. This illusion of objective separation that enables objective cognition happens in the human mind. The objective knowing of itself, the divine consciousness, performed in the initial phase by projecting nature itself as a mirror for self-knowledge. It is the first half of the circling of the divine consciousness away from itself and towards the human. In the second phase, the very act of objective self-knowledge of the divine consciousness takes place. 
the other half of this circling of consciousness away from the human and towards the divine. This act does not happen in the divine consciousness itself because it has no need to experience it. It always has it, and it always is that. It happens in that state of total separation and alienation from consciousness, from itself, in the individual mind of the human as self-knowledge. When a completely separate, alienated, and individualized human consciousness learns of its true state and true nature, all by itself, when it gets in touch with the real divine source and essence, only then can it be a true act of divine self-knowledge and the actualization of the divine consciousness in all its aspects and possibilities, even in the most incredible and most negative possibilities there is in the human. This act is far more complex than one can imagine. It is a drama with many acts to play. It is a karmic drama that souls go through during their incarnation cycle. Now here we see a picture. If you're in the YouTube video, you can see it. Of But if you're listening only, I will explain it. It's a triangle with a wavy bottom. The top is the divine absolute. The middle is the hyperspace. There's a line near the bottom and under it says the heavenly world. Below that says the cycles of incarnation. Below that, under the wavy lines of cycling moving, it says the, the physical world. And the picture is called a schematic depiction of an incarnation cycle. An incarnation cycle may vary in length, depending on the planet, civilizational development, and tasks to be resolved. Time itself is relative and depends on the presence and participation of consciousness. Cycles of extremely immature souls tend to be slower in order to enable more time for the learning process, and the ones capable of learning fast may take a considerably shorter time. The expression young or immature souls refers to those souls who are about to enter a cycle of incarnation, whereas the term mature souls refers to those who are ending it. The divine consciousness they implement is the same. It can be neither young nor old. Consciousness of the soul is attached to the impressions Vasana that keep gathering during the reoccurring life dramas. Those impressions further determine the program for future incarnations, otherwise known as karma. Each incarnation has its working plan in the point of the maturing of the mind, and the purpose is to overcome these programs in each incarnation. The cycle of incarnation is finalized only when consciousness of the soul fully matures within the physical incarnation, when the difference between consciousness is the mind and the body and the transcendental consciousness of the soul disappears. More accurately, when the transcendental consciousness integrates itself into consciousness of the mind and the functioning of the body. In other words, when the human in all possible ways realizes that consciousness and existence are the same. Time then disappears for this human as a reflection of the awakening of the divine consciousness in them. Up to that point, there is an illusion of space and time in which a conscious subject exists through incarnations that seem to unravel in linear time to them over the course of time. This is the experience of an individual bodily mind and ego only. The divine absolute loses no time on its actualization. It has already manifested all its possibilities so that all incarnations happen simultaneously and in parallel. Because everything is momentary and all possible realities take place in parallel. Incarnations happen through the illusion of linear time for the individual mind to have enough practice to be able to take on this consciousness and express in it its own way, which means creatively. Creativity is the essence of consciousness and the divine itself. This is why the divine consciousness cannot be expressed any differently than through the human process of individualization. Subsection 28. On the process of individualization and all of its psychological principles, see Carl Jung's Man and His Symbols, 1964, Aldous Books Limited, London. Now that ends this part 11 of our Physics of Consciousness with Ivan Antic. Um, as I said, one day I will put these into a full audiobook when I'm finished and uh, just release that as an MP3. Um, for everyone, but uh, 
for those of you listening right now on the YouTube, if you care about my thoughts on the book, uh, what do you think it means about aliens? If the, I believe everything in this book, okay, so check mark. But aliens, I want them to be real. And I know that higher things are speaking to us, but is that just our higher soul? That's probably all it is. Those aliens we think we're talking to are probably just our higher selves, unfortunately, because I want them to be real. And maybe I can manifest them by wanting them to be real. Who knows? There's many different tales, many different stories. One of them is that they are our future selves. Now, what do you think? Comment below, because I deeply, deeply care what you think. Because as a collective, we're probably creating it. So are they real? And I believe they are real. I want them to be real. Let's say I want them to be real. And I obviously want them to be benevolent. And I want, because I, I have visions of walking around and hearing the metal under my feet. And I have, like, I have more visions of the future than of the past. Like, when you know your past self's former self's, because your future self could be your past self. Because there's no such thing as time and space. And I have vivid, vivid, like, experiences. Like, viscerally feeling it. The running around and living in a spaceship. The longing to be on Earth. I feel that viscerally. Like, I feel the feeling of what it's like to be born on a spaceship and to never touch ground. Now, vivid imagination, other reality, fourth dimensional reality, because the fourth dimension is much bigger than the third dimension, and things can feel pretty close to real. Like he talks about in this chapter of your dream versus lucid dreaming, you can melt it away, right? Because lucid dreaming is essentially waking up and destroying the world around you. This is why I used to lucid dream and I stopped because it was exhausting. I would wake up in the morning tired. And yeah, it was a cool skill for a minute, but when I realized I was not having the same psychological therapizing healing in a lucid dream, but it was, it was fun and it was glad to do for a while. But anyways, I want to know your take on lucid dreaming too. What do you think? I, I was really tired in the morning. But also on aliens, are they real? I want to know. <laughs> or are they just our higher, higher selves? They're probably just our higher selves. We shall see. And the human will eventually create spaceships. And so it is indeed our higher selves. Or is he just talking about Earth when he talks about this? And there's a separate divine emanation of God for each planet that has life. For each solar system, perhaps. We shall see. We shall see. Thank you for tuning in.